out. Some would pull and some would push the big red tractor. And ultimately, every year, they got the field ready just in time for planting season and they produced enough fruit, uh, enough vegetables, just enough to feed the community. Yet, there was a farmer who was working through his, uh, 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 looking through his attic, and as he was going through his attic, he found the owner's manual for the big red tractor, and as he read it, to his amazement, the big red tractor would drive on its own. And he went out and he told everybody that he could, the big red tractor would move on its own. And people thought he was nuts. Some, some women said, oh, that just sounds like a fairy tale. Because for years they have pushed and pulled the big red tractor. So one night this farmer goes out and he follows the instructions that he was given, fires up the tractor, and he uh, gets the fields prepared in, a, in one evening. And the fields produced so much fruit that they were able to send out vegetables and fruits to other uh, surrounding villages so that uh, they could be a blessing to other people. And I got to thinking about the church. Man, we, we push and pull, don't we? We try to do this thing in our own strength. But Jesus says, wait for my power. If you want to accomplish those things uh, that have to do with my kingdom, you're going to have to do them in my power. Wait for me. I want to ask you this morning. Examine your life. Are you working under your own strength? Or are you working under the strength of the power of God? And you might say, I don't know, Mike. But look at the success that you're reaping. Is your life hard? Do you find it a constant struggle, spiritually speaking, just to make ends meet, just to get by, just to get to a place where you feel like, I, I've done something for the Lord? Or is your life supernatural? Are things done in and through your life that you can't even believe happen? That's the difference between walking in the Spirit, waiting on the Lord, or walking in the flesh. Jesus has called us to trust Him, to wait on Him. And I think of Jesus' words in John 15, where He says, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing, but in me, you will bear much fruit. The emphasis is on Him, not on us. But the second directive He gives us is not only to wait on Him, but to be His witnesses. And you might think, how do we do that? Well, Scripture, the owner's manual for this big red tractor, tells us. Number one, tells us love. To love people. You might think, well, yeah, I love people. I love my family. The Bible says, so what? So do the pagans. What about the people that you work with that really irritate you? What about that neighbor that is constantly harping on you about the... the uh, the line in your yards. What about that? Uh, what about that? Uh, that woman at the school uh, who doesn't uh, discipline her children, and it's affecting your children. What about them? Is your life defined by supernatural love? Do you care about other people, other than those who reside in your household? Do you care about other people besides those who are here? Jesus called us to love people. He says, the world will know you are my disciples because you love. Is your life marked by love? But then he goes on and he says, also, we'll be witnesses to this world if we're unified. Unity. Je Jesus prays for this. In John chapter 17, he says, Father, may they be one, that's you and I, as we are one, that's God and Jesus. He has called us to be unified. But can we honestly say we're unified? Can we, I mean, there are 60 different types of Baptist. We live in a town of like 500 people. There are four churches in this town. 
can we say we're unified? I mean, I think we can, but I don't think we're being honest. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses because you love people and because they see that you're unified. They see that you are one in spirit and in purpose. And man, I long for that day where we have a church, a church that doesn't gather under the banner of Baptist or Methodist or Episcopalian or Lutheran, but we gather together because we care about the kingdom. We care about honoring Jesus' name. We care about those who don't know him and love him enough to tell them about him. We care enough that we unify together and we have one purpose, and that purpose is advancing the kingdom of God, moving that golf ball down the fairway to the hole because that's what he's called us to do. He gave us two divine directives. And my question to you is, can we love and can we be unified? The answer in the flesh, no. In the spirit, yes. But moving on. He closes this passage by helping us deal with the distractions of life. He says, after he said this, he was taken up before uh, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently into the sky, and he was, er, as he was going. And suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. These young disciples were given a mission advancing the kingdom of God. They were given the means to accomplish that mission, the Holy Spirit of God. Yet, they were still distracted by the past and by the future. I mean, this passage opens up by saying that Jesus provided them many convincing proofs that he was raised. Think about that. I mean, if you saw Jesus raised, you'd think it would only take one. But it said he provided them many convincing proofs. That pain of the past was hard for them to overcome. But then it goes on to say, uh, where the disciples are sitting with Jesus and he's telling them, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. And they're saying, Lord, are you going to set up your kingdom right now? And he's like, why are you worrying about the future? I want you to advance my kingdom right now. You are in this place for a purpose that I've called you to. And then we go on to this passage where Jesus has given them this commission. He has given them the mission. He has given them the means to carry it out. And as they see him ascend, now think about that. He's ascending to heaven. They are standing in the presence of the one who was raised from the dead and is ascending into heaven before their eyes. Yet they are fixed on what's happening there. And then two men, two angels show up and he says, Guys, the mission. Remember that? Get to the mission. You waited on Jesus. Wait on him. He's going to send you his spirit. And then go about the business of making disciples. Being my witness. Loving people. Yet they're distracted. They're distracted from the very thing that God has called them to. And I would submit to you this morning that we are no different than these disciples. We're distracted by our past. Some of us in this room, we have calloused hearts. When I talk to you about being a witness, you're like, I don't care about that. What I care about is just making it. What I care about is me and my own. And your hearts become calloused. And most likely it's because you've been hurt. I talked to a, a, a buddy of mine the other day. And he was... Uh, he was talking about how he had been hurt by people. Hurt by people in the church. And now he has just hard feelings. And it's hard for him um, to hear the things of God. Do you, 
do you care about him? Because I, I do. Do you care about those people in your life that you know? Or has your heart become calloused? But we're also distracted by the future, aren't we? We have this amazing way of compartmentalizing our lives. We have, this part of my life is work. This part of my life is family. This part of my life is social life. And this part is church. Jesus, you can have this, but none of this. Why? Because we want to make sure that our 401k is to where we want it to be when we retire. Man, all that's going to burn. You ain't going to take any of it with you. Maybe what we need to hear is four. Open up your eyes to the moment that you live in. I've said this many times from this pulpit, but I mean it. We live in this time and in this place because of no mere accident. The scripture tells us in Acts chapter 20, tells us that God has placed us in this specific time, in this specific place, in this specific moment for a purpose. God is literally bringing the nations to Powers Lake, North Dakota. And he has called us to walk in his spirit and to be his witness. And the only question we have to answer is, will we do it? Because the opportunity is there. And these angels, or these men, do these young disciples a tremendous service by refocusing them on the mission. And they do so with an amazing thing. With the announcement of Jesus' return, do we believe that Jesus is going to return? Because if we do, the scripture clearly teaches that that could be at any moment. So waiting for tomorrow to be a witness today doesn't make sense. Loving people when I get over the pain of the past no longer makes sense. For Christ's church to be so splintered and divided when it's called to be unified no longer makes sense if Jesus is going to return today. And I would just close with this. Does your life make sense? Does your life and faith really make sense? So I think about my problem's golfing. And I've been given all kinds of advice, the ways to grip the club and ways to stand, but ultimately I know what the main problem is. I take my eye off the ball. And when I take my eye off the ball, it becomes incredibly difficult to hit it straight. And I think we do that with our faith. Jesus says, trust me and be my witness. Keep our eye on that ball. And when we don't do that, life just doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, what? We're going to spend our life, you know, making millions? Great. But the scripture says, what if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? You know, what if you spend your whole life trying to convince everybody that, that you're holy, that you're righteous, and you're doing it in your own effort? And, and the saddest part of all is, would be if you convinced everybody, yet you didn't know Christ. And everybody else believed you, but then you woke up in eternity, and that eternity was hell. Man, does your life make sense? Does your faith makes sense does it make sense to say well I went to church and that's good enough for this week does that make sense does that make sense to a child does it make sense that that my neighbor's hurting and he doesn't know the Lord but I'm kind of scared of what he might think if I go and just love him does that make sense no Jesus is calling us back He's saying, guys, I have this tremendous mission for you, but you have to keep your eye on the ball. And as we work through this gospel of Acts, what we're going to see is these young men and women who keep their eye on the ball.